studying the book of Daniel and this is going to be part th part three of Daniel chapter 7 so I'd like to invite um, invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel chapter 7 now for those of you who have been here last night and the other night you know we went through um, this prophecy we've explained the four bees that we have here we've explained also the little horn that we have here now, I'd like us to look at another aspect of this chapter, Daniel chapter 7. So, <clears throat> I'd like us to begin reading verse 9. So, are you there? Can you please wave your hands if you found, you know, the verse we're in Daniel 7 and verse 9. 
if Angeline is here, please tell her to put her gown on and um, be seated in front together with my son, okay? Angeline is the one that is going also to be baptized tonight. So, <clears throat> now this is what it reads. By the way, I've forgotten, you know, to say hello to the Pocahontas Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> okay, Pocahontas, can you please say amen? Amen! amen. amen. No. There are only three who wave hands at me. <laughs> Go on. Don't be shy. Don't be shy, yeah? What about the Marshallese? Okay, the Marshallese, you know. Okay, Marshallese, can you please say Yahweh? Yahweh. Yeah, there you go. There is the Yahweh. There is the Yahweh there. Okay. So we are in Daniel 7, and we're going to, to start re reading verse 9. Okay, verse 9. Okay? Ready? Okay, this is what it reads. I beheld, in the King James Version, I beheld. Daniel was looking at the visions. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down. What did he see? He was looking at the visions. He looked at the four beasts. Remember? He looked at the ten divisions of the fourth beast. And then he looked at the little horn. And he said right here, And I was looking till the thrones, plural, were cast down. Now what are the thrones that were cast down? According to the context. Okay, what were the thrones that were cast down? According to the context, it included all, all of the four kingdoms plus the little horn being cast down. Okay, so let's go and see. You know, we're coming up to something here. So he saw that this four kingdoms that we studied yesterday, uh, the other day, that they were cast down. That's what verse nine is saying. They were cast down. So we pass Babylon, we pass Medo-Persia, we pass Rome, we get to 476 AD. And then we pass, you know, the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire. And then it says right here, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And that includes the little horn that we studied last night, right? Yes. Okay, so he saw those thrones, they were cast down. They were no more. Okay, so it gives us, you know, specific date, 538 to 1798, you know, when the little horn, when the little horn was cast down, 1798. Now, there is a scene that's going to come after all of those horns were cast down. Are you following me, brother, brethren? So all of those horns were, uh, all of those thrones were cast out, and there's going to be an event. And what is that event? It says right here, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days. Who? The ancient of days. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is the ancient of days? God. 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 Huh? God. God, God, the God the Father is the ancient. He is more ancient than the days because he created the days. Now, let me just give you something here. You now, Psalms 90 and verse 2, this is what it reads. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art what? God. Thou art God. So God existed before mm -hmm. the creation. So God the Father is more ancient than the days. Now we're coming up to something here. We thought that prophecies, you know, Daniel is not God-centered. By the way, we're looking at here that Daniel chapter 7 is one of the most God-centered Christ-centered books in the Old Testament. We're going to see that in a little bit. Okay? So, we have here God the Father, the Angel of Days, did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair and the hair of his head, like the pure wool, 
His throne was like the fiery flame. And what? Did you notice that one there? And his wheels are burning fire. He was sitting on a throne that has wheels. Now, let me ask you a question. What are the wheels for? To move, right? So, it seems like God is moving from one place, one section of the heaven, into another place. And we're going to see that one later on. Okay, so it says right here, so we have got the Father. And in verse 10, Brother Colton, if you don't mind, if you can get a microphone and help me read some of the verses here. So, verse 10, And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Now, here comes you know, the word that I'd like us to notice. The judgment was what? The judgment was set. And when there was a judgment, there was something that were open. The books were open. That is the title of our sermon, of our message this evening. So there was a judgment. Who is present in the judgment? We have God the Father sitting on his throne. And then we have also thousands upon thousands that ministered unto him. Now, let me ask you a question. Who are the thousands and thousands that ministered unto him? Okay, you got it. Now, we're, what is our biblical evidence? Now, we have here biblical evidence from Revelation 5, verse 11. Brother Colton, if you can read this one, please. And I beheld, and I heard the voice... No, no, no sound. No sound. He's still in love. And I beheld, and I, <laughs> and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. So, God the Father was there, he was the judge, and then there were books that were opened, and there were, the, God the Father was not by himself. He is accompanied by thousands upon thousands of witnesses. Who are they? They were the angels in heaven. Okay? Wonderful. Now, let's keep moving on. So we have the God the Father. Where's Jesus? Let's read verse 13. And I saw in the night visions. What did he see? And behold, one like the Son of Man. Where did he go? He came with the clouds of heaven and came to the who? To the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Now, are you following the scene? Are you imagining in your mind what is taking place here? Okay, so we have the God the Father, you know, after those thrones were cast down, and there was a judgment that was set, and, the, and then the books were opened. Are you following? And there were the angels there. And then John, as he was looking at God the Father, and the angels that were present there, and the books that were opening, he saw another being that is coming to work. He's not coming to the earth. And by the way, that part right there is going to explain the problem in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Because the people thought you know, that Jesus is going to come at the end of the 2300 days in 1844. But he didn't come. Ah, they, they learned from this passage the, that instead of Jesus coming to the earth, he came with the clouds of uh, he came with the clouds of heaven to the ancient of days. Are you following? Okay, so he was coming to the ancient of days, of course, according to the context, to be with the Father in the work of what? In the work of judgment. Are we together? So God the Father was there, Jesus was there, and the angels were there doing the judgment. Now, the next question that we're going to ask, what kind of judgment is it? What kind of judgment is that? Okay, let's keep moving on. Now, I'd like us to go back and tie this one to Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Those of you who have been here um, the previous nights, we've gone through these passages. 
I'd like us to read this passage one more time, Brother Colton. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. One moment. Okay. He, he was saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Why? There is a very important event that is taking place, and He is announcing that event. What is that event? For the hour of his judgment is come. So he was announcing the judgment. Did you see now that in, in Daniel chapter 7, we have a sin of judgment. We have a what? We have a sin of judgment. The books were open. And here, the first angel is saying, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. By the way, I'd like to present to you tonight that the judgment scene that is taking place in Daniel chapter 7 is similar to the judgment scene that this first angel is announcing. And we call that the investigative judgment. It's not the punitive judgment, it's not the executive judgment that will take place after, you know, after the 1,000 years. It's not the millennial judgment, though. It's not the second coming of Jesus. How do we know that? You know, how do we know that it's the investigative judgment that is taking place? The investigative judgment that will take place before, you know, the close of probation. Because uh, according to the context here, you know, the angel is still preaching the everlasting gospel. Amen. The door of mercy has not closed yet. People could still come to Jesus and be saved. Repent, of, repent and confess their sins and be saved. Amen. Are we together? Okay, so... The judgment scene that we have in Daniel chapter 7 is parallel to the judgment that was announced by the first angel. Are we together? Are you following me? Okay, let's go. Where will judgment begin? Okay? For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So where will it begin? It will begin at the house of God. Now the question is, what is the house of God? Okay? Let's read this one. First Timothy 3 and verse 15, Brother Colton. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is in the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Oh, what did the verse say? Mm. Wow, it says right here that the household of God is no other than the church. By the way, it doesn't say here churches. Hmm. The church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of what? Of the truth. Okay? So the household of God, where judgment should begin, is no other than the church of God in the last days. Okay? Now books and the judgment. We've read in Daniel chapter 7 that there was a judgment and there were the opening of books. Now you may ask me, now what do the books in heaven look like? Do they look like those ones that we have here? Like this? <laughs> do you think they look like this? My Bible? I think they have better books in heaven. And why is it that the Bible used the terms that we are familiar with? So that we can understand what is happening in heaven. I believe that they have better things in heaven than here. Amen. Um, if the Bible was written in our days today, I believe that the author of the Bible will use computers. But since it was written before the advent of com com computers, the author of the Bible used those terms, the word, that, that the people were familiar with. Okay? So, books and the judgment. How many books do we have in the Bible? I mean, how many kinds of books that were open during the judgment? Now, let's go to the book of life. I love this book. Yeah. So, what does it contain? Okay, Luke 10 and verse 20. Colton. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. By the way, do you remember this story? It's the story of the seventy disciples. They, 
They were uh, commissioned by God to go and minister to people. They were commissioned to what cast out demons and to preach the gospel, to heal people with diseases. And when they came back, Lord, Lord, don't you know that even the demons are sub are subject unto us? We were able to cast out demons, and then they were rejoicing. And God said to them, Don't rejoice. But rejoice in this. What? What is that? Your names are written in heaven. In heaven. They were written in the book of life. Right? Philippians 4 and verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Oh, wow. The Apostle Paul said here that there were women, by the way, women that are here. How many women do we have here? Can you please raise up your head? Your names can be written in the book of life. This is right here, that there were women whose names were written in the book of life. Amen? Amen. Yes. Those who have labored in the gospel, those of you who are laboring in the gospel, those of you who are faithfully preaching the gospel of Christ, I would like to let you know that your names are written in the book of life. So be faithful in ministry. Be faithful in preaching the gospel. Amen. Amen. So what does the book of life contain? It contains the names of those people who have labored in the gospel, who have ministered to fellow sinners like us. Now, Revelation 21 and verse 27, Brother Colton. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, for they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the content of the book of life are the names of the people that will be saved. You know? uh -huh. How I wish that our names will be in the book of life. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the next one. We have also what we call in the Bible the book of remembrance. Book of remembrance, Malachi 3 and verse 16. Let me ask here, Brother Jason. You know, Brother Jason has a microphone like voice. Brother Jason is from um, the Jonesboro Seventh day Adventist Church. Brother Jason, can you please raise up your hand right now? Okay. Please read it. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Amen. What did the verse say? There is another book in heaven called what? The book of remembrance. What does it contain? It contains those who feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Not only that, Nehemiah 13 and verse 14. Colton, please. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have that have dough for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. I'm sorry, it should be done. I have done. I don't know why the end is missing. <laughs> so, <laughs> wipe not out my good deeds. Well, that means the good deeds of Nehemiah was written somewhere in heaven, and I believe it was written in a book called the Book of Remembrance. Okay? So, in the Book of God's Remembrance, every deed of righteousness is immortalized. What else? There, every temptation resisted, every evil overcome, every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled, and every act of sacrifice Every suffering and sorrow and good for Christ's sake is what? Is recorded. Those of you who have been ministering to people, those of you who have been helping out around you, those good deeds done in the name of Jesus is recorded in the book of remembrance. Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? Psalm even, 56, 8. Even the tears of prayers, the tears of rejoicing, are valued by the Lord. Amen. Beautiful, right? Amen. 
they do not go unnoticed. Those things that you're doing. Those of you who have been cleaning out this church, Sister Marty, right there from Pocahontas, she cleans up the church. And sometimes we do not say thank you a lot to, to those people. And by the way, I'd like to let you know, God is recording those kinds of deeds in the book of remembrance. Those of you who have helped people around you because they are in need, God is recording those deeds. Those of you who have said words of encouragement to people who are discouraged, they are written in God's book of remembrance. Now, if there are records of good deeds, there are also records of seeds, the book of seeds. Now, how do we know that? Because it says right here, Brother Colton, please read it. Isaiah 65, 6. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, which have burnt incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Did you notice that it is written before me? What are those? It says right here, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers. There, there is a record of every sin that we do. There is a record of every dishonest gain that we have. There is a record of every lie that we have said. The recording angel, they take note of everything that we're doing under the sun. Now, let's keep moving on. We will be judged by three things. First one is this one. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So we will be judged by our works. Are we together? What else? But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. We are going to be judged also, not only with the works that we do, but with the words that we say to people. Every idle word, we're going to answer every idle word that we have said to our family members, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, and to everyone around us. By the way, I'd like to let you know that we should be Christians in deeds and in words. That's who Jesus is. He was a true Christian in words and in action. Are we together? Amen. Next one. First Corinthians 4 and verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. By the way, we are going to be judged not only by the works and by the words. God is going also to bring into judgment, you know, the our motives. Amen. By the way, do you know, have you seen a CCTV? Now we have here a recording camera. That camera records everything that I do here. My actions, my words, and everything that I do here in front of me. But don't you know that camera cannot record what's inside of me. It cannot record what I am thinking in my mind. It cannot record what's in my heart. It cannot record my motives. By the way, the CCTV that we have in heaven is more advanced than that. Because the CCTV that we have in heaven can record even the motives that we have. The counsels of the heart. The hidden things. Those things that we think that we could hide it from our spouse. Oh, let me do this. Let me go to this website here. And I check. And my wife's not there. Oh, and it oh let, let, let me check this website. And there you are there. By the way, God is looking at you. You cannot hide anything from the Lord. Mm. Amen. So, that must call us to be Christians work. Both in a private and public life. By the way, those of you young people that are here. 
young people listen to me very well. There will come a time when you will give an account of the things that you are doing outside of your parents' counsels. I wish that I could relive my life because my life was not that very good when I was growing up. I did a lot of bad things that my parents didn't know even until today, but praise the Lord. You know, He invites us to confess all those sins and He can forgive, He can cleanse all of those sins. And I have con I have already confessed my sins to the Lord and I felt that I'm forgiven. Amen. Those of you who have sins, you can confess them to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The standard of the judgment. Okay. James 2.12 So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. We, the, the standard of the judgment is not other than the law of the Lord. We've uh, studied the law of the Lord um, in the previous nights. So now we have also a lawyer. If there is a judgment, then there must be somebody that is accused. There must be somebody that is defending the accused, right? And we have also the accuser. So, who is the lawyer? Okay? 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Who is our lawyer? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. 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 Who is our lawyer again? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus Amen Christ. for that. He is our Savior. He is our creator. He is also our lawyer. Now, we're going to go to the next one. So we have here a judgment. There is a tribunal scene. What do we have? Tribunal scene. We have a tribunal scene. So we have somebody that accuses. And we know already that we have a lawyer. And we have somebody that is being accused of something. Now, who do you think is the one that is being accused here? Uh, well, of course, you know, God's people, they are accused of something. Let's, now, who is the accused? Satan. Satan. Revelation 12.10 And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Wow, it says right here that we have a we have an accuser, the accuser of our brethren, which accused them what? They accused night. them day and night. He doesn't sleep, you know, Brother Colton, he is not following your health counsels, right? So because it says right here he doesn't sleep. He accuses them before our God day and night. Now, I'd like us to imagine here. So, I do not know if I have here. Okay, we, we have the verse here. Zechariah 3, 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? By the way, I'd like to uh, say something here. Let's say that we have... Um, let me see here. Brother Colton. No. Brother Colton stands before the judgment court of the Lord. The books, the record of his life are open. And the angels were witnessing. And Satan knew all of the temptations that he did on Brother Colton. No? Those secret things that probably Marisa doesn't know until now. No? And his life is passed before you know, this court. And Satan comes. By the way, that one is mine. That guy is mine. And he, present the, he presents those sins in a very exaggerated way. You know, he did this thing right here. You know, when he was by himself, he did this one right here. When he is uh, when he was in Pocahontas, you know, he did this thing right here while doing he's doing Bible working. No, I'm not saying that you are doing that. Okay, okay so <clears throat> now Jesus cannot excuse those sins. He cannot say, by the way, Satan, that one is not correct. He cannot deny. 
he has to be honest because Satan would come. Hey, you are excusing that sin. You are excusing that sin. You've got to excuse my sins too. Mm. Huh? Did you notice that? And all of the angels, you know, that are with him, they will come to Jesus. Hey, you excuse that sin. Excuse mine too. Mm. So the record books are accurate. Must be accurate because Satan is very aware of the sins that he has caused Colton to commit. Are, are we together? Are you following me? So, now, but then Jesus would, would say, hey, by the way, look at this one. Look at this record life. By the way, he has repented of this. He has turned away from the sins. And he did not do the sin anymore. By the way, are there sins in your life? That you have not surrendered to Jesus. Those kinds of sins would be brought up into the judgment. You got to give them to Jesus. Amen. Jesus can take out those sins. He is the only one that has the power to take out those sins. That's right. Amen. Are you addicted with pornography? By the way, those of you young people, the pornography is still an offensive sin until now. Mm. Fornication is still an offensive sin right now. Lying. Lying is still an offensive sin right now. You've got to teach this mouth through the grace of the Lord. You know, to speak honesty at all times, truthfulness at all times. Okay? <clears throat> and then Jesus would say, Hey, Satan, he has, I'm not excusing his sin, but look at this one. He has repented of that sin. That's why this person is mine, it's not yours. We're going to go to a powerful one later on. Um, now, I'm going to go and. Go to the next one. Names accepted and rejected. Look at this one. Exodus 32, verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever had sinned against me, him will I what? Him will I blot out of my book. Does God blot out the names of people? Yes, it says right here. He was talking to Moses. Because Moses wanted God to forgive his people. And then, God said to Moses, let me alone, let me destroy them. Oh Lord, if, if you will destroy, uh, blot out my book so that they can be saved. He was offering his life for his people. What a great leader, right? And God said, you know, whosoever had sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Please read this commentary. It's my own commentary, Brother Colton. When someone has sins left in the record books, without repentance and without forgiveness, their names will be removed from the book of life. Wow, what a tragedy. What a disastrous thing. It's the most terrible thing that can happen in your life. Mm. God forbid, it should not happen unto you. It should not happen unto me. Ezekiel 18, verse 24, Colton. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth, committeth iniquity, and do it according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned, and his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, and then shall he die. By the way, nobody can pluck you out from God's hands. Nobody. No human being. But God can pluck out your name from the book. That's what he said here. God can pluck you out of his hand. Satan cannot pluck you out from the hand of Jesus. No human being, not even a pastor, can pluck you out from the hand of Jesus. But Jesus can pluck you out of his hand. How accurate are the books? Well, let's see the CCTV in heaven. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Look at that one. Look at the one, my dear young people. You know, it says right here that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. His eyes are here in Pocahontas. His eyes are in Harrisburg, where I live. His eyes are there in your room. And He knows what you are doing. He knows what you are thinking. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what you are doing with your phone. He knows what you are saying to those people. Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, 
everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It says right here, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Mm -hmm. Brethren, there is nothing that we can hide from the Lord. You know, there is nothing that you can hide from Jesus and from the Holy Spirit. You may hide it from your parents. There may be scenes that you alone know until today, but God knows everything. We cannot hide anything from the Lord. So we must live. We must live true Christianity even in our private life. We cannot deceive the Lord. We cannot come to the church and dress up like me and pretend to be like a good disciple of the Lord. Sit down here as if you are not doing any foolishness somewhere else. God knows all of those things. He is not deceived by the appearance of piety. He knows what you do. In your private life, he knows what you do in your public life. So we must be honest to the Lord. He Amen. knows what you are thinking. That's why, you know, the technology that we have in heaven is better, you know, than the CCTV that we have. Now, please, let, let me read this one. But when the archangel Michael, now who is Michael? Jesus. By the way, he is no other than Jesus, and I can prove to you. There are five, five, uh, five passages in the Bible that speaks about Mike, the archangel. He is no other than Jesus. Look at this one. So Moses died, but according to the scriptures, he died. And what happened after he died? There was contention. So who were fighting for the body of Moses? This is right here. Michael, the archangel, contending with the what? The devil. devil. With the devil. Oh, man. You know, when I read that verse, and I began to meditate upon the verse, I said like this. So, the devil did not give up on the body of Moses. He was contending with Jesus. Hey, you cannot take that to heaven. That body is mine. And then, on the other side is Michael. This is mine. And because Satan is accuser of the brethren, and he exaggerates all of those accusations, he said, by the way, he sinned. What was his sin? Okay, the one thing, that one sin that he did. Wow, Satan is not giving up for one sin that one of the greatest men in the Bible had committed. And I was asking myself, how much more for my body? He, Satan will contend for my body when I, when I die. I have a lot of sins in my past. You have a lot of sins. Satan will not give up easily on your body. Look at this one right here. Let me read it again. But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the what? The body, of Moses. body of Moses. They were contending. Satan is not giving up on the body of Moses. Hey, that's mine. Jesus said, no, that's, that cannot be yours. And then Satan will come back again. Hey, he sinned. Do you remember when he, when you commanded him to struck the rock? Uh, to, to speak to the rock. And by the way, don't you know that the rock represents Jesus? And Jesus is going to be smitten only one time. And Moses struck it twice. And do you remember what God said to, to Moses? By the way, Moses, you did not what? Sanctified me in the eyes of the congregation. Because there's deeper meaning of that. Of that striking of the rock. Mm. If the devil, devil did not give up on the body of Moses, I believe that he will not be giving up on your bodies on my body when I'm, when I'm dead. By the way, brethren, this is a serious thing. I, I hope that we are realizing the great controversy mess that we are in. The devil will contend for your body and for my body, and it's time for us, 
you know, to rectify the lives that we live in the eyes of the Lord. Number one tonight, I'd like to make, I'd like to make an appeal. We've been making an appeal night after night. And the Lord has been working in your heart. By the way, look at this one. We have a loving God. He says here, Romans 8 and verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate. Look at this one. Listen to the voice of God speaking to you tonight. No one will be able to separate us from who? From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've been saying this every night because this is really true that we are the most precious creature in this world. We are the most important creature in the eyes of the Lord. I've been saying that over and over again. You know why? Because it is true. The gospel has elevated us. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. Your past is your past. God loves you no matter what. Amen. You know what? It is God's love that will ultimately lead you to repentance. Amen. It is love that will ultimately conquer you and soften your hearts. It is the great love that God of God that drives you to abandon your sins and live in obedience to Him. Listen to those words. By the way, talking about love, right? Do you know, in order to understand the love of God, I think, you know, the mothers understand better. Now, how many of you here are mothers? No? Oh, wonderful. We have mothers here. You may understand this one. I don't know if you've seen a mother cleaning her 20-day-old son. You remember mothers? You know? You've done those kinds of work, right? Cleaning your 20-day-old son who soiled the diaper. Now the mother removes, you know, that soiled diaper and set it aside carefully and tenderly. Is that true, mothers? And then she washes, she washes and sanitizes her son and after that, what does she do? Come on, mothers. She gives him a kiss. Work. At the buttocks. Mm-hmm. Do you remember, mothers? Okay. I'd like to let you know. That is a faint picture of the love of God for us. We have lived in this world 13 diapers. We have lived in this world, dirty diapers, putting stains in every place. That's the life that we have lived here. But you know that your that your past. God says to you, my son, I love you. Let me take you into my arms. Let me carry you. I love you. But you say, Oh Lord, I'm not worthy of your love. Of course you are not worthy of your lo- of his love. But God does not love you because you are worthy. He loves you in spite of your unworthiness, in spite of those sins that you have committed, in spite of those broken promises that you may you've made to him. You've said to him a lot of times, Lord, I will follow you now. Now after that. You have forgotten all of those promises. God loves you in spite of those broken promises. And you may say, 
Well, I don't deserve God's love. That's true again. Nobody here deserves God's love. But God offers His love to you. Not because you deserve it. He offers His love to each one of us. Because He loves us just the way we are. He loves us in spite of our past, in spite of our sins. Do you hear His voice talking to you tonight? He says to you, I love you. Have you shattered your dreams? Have you shattered your life? Jesus said, let me get those broken pieces and let me rebuild them. Let me reconstruct them. It's not too late for you to give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of beginning for every one of you. You are precious in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. You mean everything to Him. You are a part in His mind and in His heart. He bought you with His own blood at the cross of Calvary. Jesus offers His love there at the cross of Calvary. And He says, I love you with an everlasting love. True Lord, tonight I'd like to make an appeal. We have here these two precious individuals. They are young, but they are precious in the eyes of the Lord, just the way they are. Amen. By the way, I'd like to let you know, you can come to Jesus just the way you are. Amen. You can come to Him with all those fumbles, with all those failures that you have, and give it to Him. He will clean your heart. Let me ask, ask Sister Angeline, please come over here. I'd like to present you to the congregation. Please come over here, Johanna. Johanna, he is my son. And I'm touched. You know, I was talking with him this afternoon. And I said to him, Do you really want to be baptized? Why do you want to be baptized? And he said to me, I want. What did he say again? What did he say again? Yes. Anyway, those of you who have been thinking, thinking to step forward and give your life to Jesus, don't delay. The Bible said today is the day of salvation. That's right. Next month may be too late for you. Next week may be too late for you. We don't know the future. What is the big reason why you don't give your life to Jesus? 